Maybe you have a fear that when people find out that you're all in for Jesus, that they'll reject you socially. Because Jesus said, if they hated me, they'll hate you too. Persecution is promised. Rejection on some level is promised to the believer. So that is a possibility. You ever hear the saying, you run into an asshole in the morning, you ran into an asshole. You run into assholes all day, you're the asshole. Welcome back everyone to Bridge the Divide, where I examine irrational beliefs, the irrational behaviors that often follow, and how we, with education, rationality, and reason, can bridge the societal divides that they create. We're back today with another video featuring Louisiana revivalist Robert Presson. You remember him, right? He's that evangelical who set up shop in the French Quarter to convert people to Christianity, while simultaneously disparaging the people of the French Quarter as being the spiritually darkest and hardest to reach. Up yours, Bobo. Yeah. Now, previously, I mentioned that it was Robert's Seven Signs of Jesus' Return video that initially got my attention. And I promised you, and Robert, that I would come back to address how that video was a complete joke at a later date. And you know me. I'm a man of my word. So let's dive into Robbo's video, critically examine his reasoning, and expose exactly how he comes to the fallacious conclusions that he does. Today I want to give you seven signs that Jesus is coming back sooner than you think. Personally, I'm deeply curious as to what exactly these signs of Jesus' imminent return are. Not only from a biblical perspective, because Matthew 24, 36 states, no one knows the day or hour when these things will happen, not even the angels in heaven or the Son himself. Which of course also implies that there exists no means to successfully predict when the event will take place, but also from the atheist perspective because of certain other claims that are made in the Bible, such as Matthew 24, 34, Mark 13, 30, and Luke 21, 32, which all state this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. But since none of those things took place historically and Jesus did not return in that generation, I'm curious how anything you're going to posit here, Robert, isn't anything more than an ad hoc rescue. Sign number one is the rebirth of the nation of Israel. Matthew 24 is one of the most prophetic chapters in all of the Bible. In other words, it deals with the topic of the end times. Just like the book of Revelation deals with the end times, Matthew 24 actually parallels the book of Revelation. Actually, Robert, seeing as how biblical scholarship dates the writing of the book of Mark to around 70 CE, and the book of Revelation is dated to around 95 CE, it would be the book of Revelation that is paralleling the book of Mark. You've got to represent these things in their correct order, Robert, to make sure that you're not implying a level of connectivity that you can't justify. And so in this chapter, the disciples ask Jesus, what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? For those unfamiliar with the story, this particular conversation supposedly took place when Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives after commenting to his disciples that all of the buildings that they see, or technically all of the systems that they see in place all around them, would eventually be torn down. You know, it's that classic apocalyptic stuff that apocalyptic preachers are so well known for. So in the rest of the chapter, Jesus speaks about the signs of his return. One of the things Jesus told his disciples concerning his return was this. Now learn a lesson from the fig tree. When its branches bud and its leaves begin to sprout, you know that summer is near. In the same way, when you see all these things, you can know that his return is very near, right at the door. Ah, the parable of the fig tree. To give this narrative some context, fig trees were historically important both as a favored treat and as a symbol of strength and wisdom throughout the cultures of the Mediterranean. Given the historical regional importance of the fig tree, it has been argued that the parable of the fig tree in the Gospels is symbolic of the nation of Israel, with Christ using its budding and that time when he cursed a fig tree as metaphors to represent the Jewish people's acceptance or rejection of God. On a side note, that Christ's ministry in the Bible lasts roughly three years, which also happens to be the average fruiting cycle of a fig tree, is quite obviously a deliberate narrative parallel. Every Jewish person who heard Jesus refer to the fig tree would have known beyond a shadow of a doubt that he was speaking about the nation of Israel and using the fig tree as a picture of the nation of Israel. 
Be honest now, Robert, that claim is still under contention. There is some disagreement between many Christian faiths and sects as to what exactly Christ was referring to in the parable of the fig tree. And the reason that disagreement exists is because the story itself is technically hearsay, and the people who read it interpret it eisegetically, meaning in a manner that supports their personal feelings regarding the narrative. So when we look at the end times scene and how it all plays out in the Bible, it has everything to do with the nation of Israel. Some people have said, that Israel is God's prophetic timepiece for the end times. Once again, that's one way of interpreting the passage, and you unfortunately cannot justify one interpretation over the other. It also begs the question as to why this God would necessarily choose this one small tribe in this one small area of the world to be of such cosmic significance, when logically nothing dictated that the God must do that as opposed to revealing itself and all the information it wants to all the people around the world equally. Now, the amazing thing about the rebirth of the nation of Israel is that for 1900 years, Israel was not a nation. That's correct. Israel was not always a nation as humans typically define them. Essentially, the nation of Israel described those people who historically inhabited the southern Levant, an area known as Eretz Israel. The inhabitants of Israel were scattered throughout the whole earth. And what leads you to that conclusion? No, Robert. The Israelite people were not scattered all about the entire planet. That claim is easily disputed by the mountains of evidence contained in the fields of archaeology, anthropology, and genetics. The historical Israelite people were pretty much just scattered around the southern Levant, or as it states like nine times in the Bible, from Dan to Beersheba, or the three times that it states from the entrance of Hamath unto the brook of Egypt. I think it also goes without saying that the authors of the Bible had no concept of a western hemisphere. So from the author's perspective, pretty much the whole of the earth was about as far as they could physically see and travel at the time. They had no homeland uh, to speak of. Wrong, 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 wrong. Wrong, 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 wrong. That's also incorrect because it's defined in Jewish belief that the land of Israel is designated as the area where Jewish religious law prevailed and excluded areas where the law was not applicable. Now, of course, thoughts and beliefs don't really make for very good borders, so what was definitionally the land of Israel was very nebulous in nature. But in May of 1948, the United Nations recognized Israel as its own sovereign nation. That's correct. David Ben-Gurion proclaimed the establishment of the state of Israel on May 14th, 1948. Do you have a flag? And the nation of Israel was born in one day, as the Bible prophesied. So this is a misrepresentation of Isaiah 66, 8. Nowhere in that passage does it state that Israel will be born in a day. It specifically states that things like nations and lands are not born in a day by acknowledging that things like this take time and effort to bring them about. And given that the establishment of the state of Israel was specifically driven by individuals who wanted it to happen, based solely on their belief that it would happen, exposes this so-called prophecy as nothing more than the Pygmalion effect, that a belief about an outcome drives the actions that make the outcome ultimately come to pass. Now that is very significant because the Great Tribulation, which is an event that happens during the end times, starts off with the Antichrist signing a covenant or a peace treaty with the nation of Israel. Obviously, this is something that never happened and is nothing more than just another extraordinarily vague prophecy in the Bible. We also know that narratively, the book of Revelation was specifically addressing the Nero Redivivus legend, which was a popularly held belief at the time that Emperor Nero would supernaturally return after his death in 68 CE. As the Antichrist character is a narrative mockery of Christ, including the resurrection, it's concluded by scholarship that Nero, who was infamous for his ordered persecution of the Christians during the time of his reign was the individual being surreptitiously referred to as the Antichrist. All of the elements that Robert is referring to applied solely to the time period in which the author lived. The fact that these events didn't come to pass as the book said they would has inclined some Christians to ad hoc rescue these passages by kicking the can down the road of time lest they be forced to acknowledge that their holy book is not infallible and thus not the divinely inspired word of their God. So if there's no nation then there's no peace treaty. 
And if there's no nation, then the end times scenario can't play out like it's prophesied in the Bible. But if the people who believe that such an event will take place, then deliberately engage in the work to bring about that specific outcome, then it no longer counts as a prophecy, Chief. So now that Israel is a nation again, it's a sign to us that the return of Christ is very near. No, it absolutely isn't. Because there is no specific time period in which the purported fall and rebirth are meant to take place. There are other nations on this planet that have existed for thousands of years. And if the term nation here doesn't mean an established and singularly governed group of people, and only implies a group of people who follow a particular culture, well, there are cultures on this planet that are tens of thousands of years old. And even if the nation of Israel were to somehow fall in the future, and not be completely absorbed by the surrounding nations, and then somehow re-establish itself once again as an independent nation, would still not be confirmation that the prophecy was coming true because the whole thing falls apart if your God doesn't show up after the fact. Just like it didn't show up in accordance with the original terms of the prophecy written back in the first century. Sign number two, the rise of RFID microchip technology. Have you not marveled as information technology has surged forward? No. Oh shit. It appears Robert's one of those evangelicals that interprets the rise of technological interconnectivity as a sign of the impending apocalypse. Just for those who may be unfamiliar, radio frequency identification technology, or RFID, was invented by electrical engineer Charles Watton back in 1983. So let's see why Robert thinks that RFID tags are a sign of the end times. The increase in technology paves the way for the mark of the beast. In other words, it provides an avenue for the Antichrist to set up his system on the Earth. Boy, that escalated quickly. Fuck, he is really serious about this. Okay, well, last I checked, the quote-unquote mark of the beast or number of the beast was from Revelation 13, 15 through 18. Now, depending on the translation, the Bible indicates that the mark or number of the beast will either be 666 or 616, which are numbers that are derived through the use of either Hebrew gematria or Greek isopsophy, which is the practice of assigning numerical values to letters or words and then adding them up to get other values and then using the total total number of those values as a metaphorical bridge to other words. As a side note, biblical scholarship pretty much agrees that the original number that appeared in Revelation was 616 as it corresponds to the name Nero. And it's posited that the 666 came about later, either by analogy with 888, which is the Greek number for Jesus, an alternate spelling of the emperor's name, or because it's a triangular number, being the sum total of the first 36 numbers. Revelation 13 verses 16 and 17 says this, and he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. Yeah, just because a book says a thing doesn't make it true. When the Antichrist takes power, he will institute an economic system that will require people to take a mark in their hand or in their forehead, and that mark will determine whether people can buy or sell and make financial transactions. Yes, yes, we're all familiar with the Antichrist's purported global economic system that would essentially stop anyone who doesn't bear the mark on their hand or their forehead from engaging in any form of commerce. Over the centuries, many evangelicals have added things like access to education, social services, banking, voting, healthcare, and even the right to have children to this understanding. Almost as if the threats that what will happen have to be intensified over time in response to people becoming less and less concerned about these silly claims in one particular ancient book. But how about you get to the point, Robert? How exactly does the invention of the RFID chip in the 80s imply that Jesus is coming back soon? Up until recently, people speculated that the mark of the beast would be a tattoo in people's hand or in their forehead. Well, yeah, because at the time and place when that story was written, tattoos and scarification were the only ways to permanently mark an individual for ready identification. Given that this means of identification was applied equally to both citizens and slaves of the empire, that paper identification wouldn't be introduced until 1414 CE with the introduction of King Henry V's Safe Conducts Act, and there is no mention of such a thing in the quote-unquote prophecy, then it stands to reason that the author of Revelation thought that the mark of the beast would be an easily identifiable tattoo or brand. Why did they speculate that? Because they did not 
have the technology that would allow them to envision what this system might look like. And that's the problem that you're ignoring, Robert. If the fine details of the purported prophecy are limited in their scope by the constraints of the circumstances of the time period, then you turning the words of the prophecy into a metaphor to reflect what you currently know turns your entire conclusion into an ad hoc rescue. There is no logical contradiction in a prophecy, especially one coming from a god, giving surgically precise details of future events. But if the parameters of the prophecy only reflect what the author is aware of at the time and give no specified time period in which the events are supposed to take place, then when the events don't take place within the author's lifetime, thus forcing future generations to change the interpretation of the text to fit the circumstances of their own time periods, then definitionally that's no longer a prophecy. That's just you trying fallaciously and irrationally to grasp at any straw you can possibly conjure to keep your prior held faith position alive. But now we have RFID technology, which I'm sure you've seen in the news or in other places where people put a microchip the size of a grain of rice or smaller into their hand and they can scan it just like people do with their phones to make purchases. Okay, so RFID implants were first experimented with back in 1998 by British computer engineer Kevin Warwick. And since then, virtually all of the work done with RFID chip implantation has been done through demonstration. As of today, while this luxury option, which generally retails around $300, is offered by a few companies and is available to those who can afford it, no country on the planet has initiated a legal requirement for chipping human beings for any purpose. And while there are a number of phenomenal positives for this kind of technology, including instantaneous access to up-to-date medical history, identity security, detecting performance enhancing in professional sports, and even anti-kidnapping and trafficking measures, there is also an avalanche of major social, biological, and ethical issues that must be addressed first, such as risks of infection, corrosion leading to data loss, cancer, nefarious biohacking, violent chip theft, loss of personal autonomy, and ableism. Not to mention the infrastructure necessary for overhauling the individual economic systems of every country on the planet, providing the technology and going through the process of chipping billions of people, putting the best possible security protocols in place, and then setting up the system that maintains all those systems, would be astronomically expensive, and at this time is considered both extremely risky and cost prohibitive. And until these issues are sorted out, which they may very well never be, it is extremely unlikely that RFID implantation will become widespread anytime soon. I also have to point out, Robert, that there is something that you are deliberately ignoring. And that is the fact that evangelicals reacted in this exact same way to the advent of basic fingerprinting technology, something that was first utilized by the Qin Dynasty back in the 2nd century and went widespread in the late 19th century as a forensic measure in criminal investigations. And when those evangelicals finally figured out that fingerprinting technology was actually a huge advancement in the applications of law and justice, <laughs> and not a harbinger of the end of the world. They finally moved on to try and find the next big technological advancement that they could twist to keep their belief alive. In fact, I have a video on my channel of a woman in Australia who did just that, and it shows her scanning her hand over the sensor uh, to buy groceries. Robert, while I recognize that brand reinforcement is an important part of that whole being a YouTuber thing that I mentioned in the last video I did on you, that particular video that you're citing is nothing but cherry picking. A handful of people around the world demonstrating the use of technology that you don't particularly like for TikTok clout is a far cry from a singular government-directed and enforced implementation of global economic and commerce systems. The sudden social novelty of a thing says nothing as to its overall staying power. And if you don't believe me, just take a look at 3D TVs, Girls Gone Wild, and the Sega Dreamcast. <laughs> The world really could have been a better place. We already do this with phones. In fact, today I was checking out at a store and when I got to the register, I realized that I had left my debit card at home, but there was no problem because I just pulled my iPhone out and used Apple Pay. I just scanned my phone right over the sensor and I was able to make a purchase. <laughs> Congratulations. You successfully utilized technology that was introduced almost a decade ago. How very technocratic of you. Well. This RFID technology skips the phone. You just put your hand right there over the sensor to make the purchase. Wow, that's, that's, that's fantastic work, man. You have, the, you have the wisdom of a six or 7,000 year old man. That's fantastic. We don't have to fill up the whole blackboard after all. Now, while I'm not saying dogmatically that this 
technology is the mark of the beast? Translation, Robert's leaving the prophecy open to more interpretation so that he can adjust it later in the event that the prophecy doesn't come to pass in the way that he's currently interpreting it. Robert also seems to be unaware that this particular concession creates a logical contradiction with the dogmatic nature of his video's title. However, I am saying that the technology is here. If the Antichrist wanted to roll out his system today, he could do it. Jesus Christ is coming back sooner than you think. Wait a second, Robert. By claiming that the current rise in technology could potentially allow for this specific event to happen, should the various future agents involved choose to utilize it in this particular fashion, completely refute your claim that the rise in technology is an absolute sign. All you've actually done, Robert, is invoke the irrational faith-based belief that these prophecies will happen, then point to a thing in the modern world that you don't like or agree with, and then unjustifiably call that thing a sign of the end times, so you you can then profit from the ignorance-born panic of your audience that you alone are the source of. All in all, this is nothing more than arrogant, predatory fear-mongering. Sign number three is another invention. The rise of live stream and mobile technology. Well, if that's the case, then this has been a sign since global media coverage became a thing with the introduction of the television back in 1927. All the things that we have today, like the internet, are just nitro-charged versions of the exact same thing. The rapid transmission of information across the world. In the book of Revelation, there are two events that when they take place, the whole world will see them. Uh, unless those two events are the World Cup and the Super Bowl, I guarantee they won't be. One of them is in Revelation 11, where two witnesses or two prophets are slain in the streets. The Bible says the whole world sees this happen. Yeah, but remember, Robert, for the author of Revelation, the entire world was literally only so far as they could physically see and travel. These people weren't even aware of what was going on in India, China, or Australia, let alone the fact that an entire Western Hemisphere existed. It will always be inappropriate to interpret ancient text solely through a contemporary lens because you run the risk of adding or inferring context to the passages that the author themselves never could have intended. So as far as just the text goes, such an event would be understood to be taking place somewhere within the surrounding area, and the witnesses would be anyone who was local to that area. The second one is the beast's false resurrection in Revelation 13. It says the whole world will see and marvel. Well, yeah, the entire story is written in reference to the Nero Redivivus legend. The false resurrection being referred to would be the return of Nero after his death. And being, you know, the emperor of Rome, it follows that the Roman Empire would give allegiance to him. And all of this tracks given how terrified Christians were of Nero because of his ordered persecution of them. But unfortunately for the Bible, none of those events took place. Yes, very sad. Anyway. So all you're doing, Robert, is dishonestly removing the Nero Redivivus context and reapplying the claim to something that you're interpreting today instead of just sucking it up and admitting that this particular prophecy spectacularly failed. Time to start packing. Now, how would the whole world be able to see an event like that take place live before their eyes until recently? And actually, very recently. Quite easily, if the entire world in your conception is just the immediate surrounding area, which is all we can reasonably infer given the author's perspective. While I don't watch sports and I hardly watch any entertainment for that matter, I don't think Robert realizes the sheer magnitude of just how much that statement tracks. My family and I enjoyed watching the World Cup recently. Told ya. I found out later that 1.5 billion people were able to watch the World Cup because not only is television available, but live stream technology is available and people can watch an event like that live. Sadly, you've already earned that achievement this session, Robert, but congrats on not being a total technophobic troglodyte. About a quarter of the world's population was watching a sports game as it happened. Robert, when the international zeal for football completely escapes you, count yourself as seriously behind the times. And now when any major event happens, people can just get out their phones and live stream what's happening while it's happening and people can see it in real time. Where the bloody hell have you been? I don't know about you, but it is truly adorable how intensely he is explaining all of this information that we've all been aware of since 2011 before the news can get there, before the police can get there. When any major event happens, people can just take out their phones and film what's happening and people can see it. What will they think of next? I can be riding down the interstate in a car, or I can be flying on an airplane, and I can watch what's happening halfway around the world because of live stream technology. Get on with it. Yes, get on with it. Yeah! 
Get on with it! These events in the book of Revelation would not have been able to unfold until this generation. Unless, of course, you're just post hoc rationalizing the context of the scripture so that you can save your inerrant book from the doom of what is obviously a failed prophecy. Sign number four, increased travel. Seeing as how the authors of the Bible would likely die of fright if they ever saw anything like a car or an airplane, I'm very curious to see how he's going to ad hoc this one. In Daniel 12, 4, it says this, But thou, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book, even to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro. I believe this phrase, run to and fro, refers to the increase of travel that we've seen in recent years. It doesn't matter that you claim to believe it, Robert. The question is, can you justify that belief without resorting to fallacious reasoning? And the answer is, of course, you can't. Just a hundred years ago, if you wanted to go somewhere across the world, you had to get on a boat and take weeks to get there. You might want to check your history there, Robert. Commercial air flights began in 1914, which was 109 years ago. Yes, I know I'm just being pedantic, but I'm also technically correct. The best kind of correct. Trains didn't exist until the 1800s. Technically, the first steam locomotive was built in 1804 by Richard Trevithick, and it ran iron from Merthyr Tidville to Aberkinnon in Wales. But that factoid is completely useless and irrelevant because trains don't cross oceans, so I have no idea why Robert brought them up. But think about the way it works right now. I'm in the United States right now. Yeah, don't remind me. But I could leave my house this morning, go to the airport, and be in Europe by lunchtime. You promise? or I could be in the Middle East before dinner time. That one didn't age quite so well. I could be in Tokyo before bedtime. Every year, there are 100,000 airplanes flying above your head. Many people are traveling rapidly all around the world conducting business and leisure. To answer your question, frankly, yes, I could have cut the entire half of this video out where Robert smugly explains things to us that we already know. But since I had to sit through it all, now so do you. <laughs> And the Bible says it's a sign of the end times. Unless you're using some weird new age version of the Bible, that collection of books never mentions anything about planes, trains, or automobiles. Hell, it doesn't even mention bicycles. As far as the author was concerned, going to and fro was strictly limited to the Sandal Leather Express. Sign number five is the knowledge explosion. So, basically the direct consequence of sign number three? Robert, are you just looking at things all around the office and saying that they're signs of the end times? In the same verse, Daniel 12, 4, it says one of the signs of the end is that knowledge shall be increased. Seeing as how the increase in knowledge is something that has occurred pretty much throughout human history, you can pretty much conclude that the author would make the inductive inference that people in the future will likely know more than the people in the past. Which means prophesizing that knowledge will increase in the future is like prophesizing that the sun will rise. Ultimately, it tells us nothing. Did you know that 50% of inventions that have ever been invented have been invented in the last 30 years? Or did you know that 90% of scientists who have ever lived are alive today? While interesting facts, they are unfortunately irrelevant. Because you, Robert, cannot demonstrate the logical connection between what it says in your ancient book and your contemporary observations. Which is precisely why you made your video explaining how you spun those connections out of whole cloth. We are experiencing a knowledge explosion, and the Bible says that's one of the signs of the end. And yet it doesn't, Robert, because the text is so phenomenally vague that you could simply refer to any period of human history where knowledge rapidly expanded between the first century and now, and you could easily interpret that to fit what it says in the text, which is precisely what evangelicals like you have been doing for hundreds of years. Sign number six is a one-world government, a one-world economy, and a one-world ruler. 
Also irrelevant because none of that has ever happened. You could say the Romans got close, but they only managed to secure about 2 million square miles at their height, which is just under 3.5% of the total land on Earth. The Book of Revelation refers to a beast system, and what that is is a one-world government under a one-world ruler who institutes a one-world economy. Yes, and in the context of the Book of Revelation, that is referring specifically to the Roman Empire. It's not referring to the planet because, remember, Robert, the author wasn't aware of the other 97% of the Earth that exists. Now, we already talked about the one world economy when we talked about the mark of the beast, which I previously debunked. Now, from here, I cut out about a minute of Robert's video where he's just quoting numerous times from the book of Revelation and the book of Daniel. Primarily because we've all heard that nonsense before, but also because I was more curious as to what contemporary references he was going to cite as correlations. Fun fact... He doesn't reference anything at all. He just repeats the claim that all of these things are going to happen. The nations of the world coming together is a sign of the end. That's it. He doesn't reference anything in the modern world to tie these particular passages to. He just repeats them straight from the book as if they mean something. And now to end on a positive note. I assure you, Robert, the positive note is that your ending. Sign number seven is global gospel preaching and worldwide revival. Which, of course, is not something that is happening around the world. I know that the advent of easy access to videos from all around the planet may make it look that way, Robert, but that's what happens when you deliberately avoid exposing yourself to all of the relevant information that is available to you. Your reasoning becomes desperately myopic. Now, looking at it from a historical perspective, I would hazard that Christianity is actually on its last gasp to remain relevant in this world. That whole sudden increase in global gospel preaching that you're talking about, Robert, that's not a sign of the end times for the world. It's a sign of the end times for Christianity. It too will eventually find itself relegated to the scrap heap of ancient human ideas, right along with the thousands of other religions and faith systems that preceded it. And honestly, it's a deserved fate that will only be hastened by the persistent work of intellectually dishonest, fear-mongering grifters like Robert Presson. Thank you so much for watching, and as always, be safe, be excellent to each other. And together we can bridge the divide. Hey there, I'm here in this little window. I thought I'd try something a little bit different. Um, if you'd like to support the channel, you can like, you can dislike, you can comment, subscribe, share the video. Uh, we've also got channel memberships and we've got some sweet gear and we've got a squeaky toy that you can get and you can support the podcast. So, uh, you know, you know what to do. You're adults, you know what to do.